Yes, uh, thank you uh, everyone for coming and uh, thank you Dr. Circolo for uh, being back this week to continue teaching the series. Over to you. My pleasure. I will get us started. So Rabbi Kelman wrote me that um, he'd be in New Jersey this evening. So I wrote back to him and I said that I can see New Jersey from my window. If he waves, I'll wave back to him. So apparently he's in Princeton, New Jersey, which is just a wee bit too far for us to exchange waves, but in any event. Okay, so um, just to remind you, Last week, we got up to the 19th century. And in introducing and speaking, albeit briefly, about Moses Mendelssohn uh, and his Judeo-German translation of the Torah and his uh, commentary on it called the Be'ur, I mentioned that that was kind of a watershed moment in the history of biblical interpretation. Pretty much up until Mendelssohn, um, there were two flavors of biblical commentary, pshat and drash. Um, from Mendelssohn on, um, we get not only more flavors of biblical interpretation, but pretty much for the first time, we get people who say that they're allergic to biblical interpretation. That is to say, there begins in the 19th century, along with the Haskalah, the movement called the uh, Wissenschaft des Judentums, the science of Judaism. Um, and uh, they basically um, took the position that the Bible needed to be approached the way any work of literature was approached at that point in time. Even the study of literature has changed over the last uh, 200 years. Um, and therefore, whatever were considered to be the proper scientific methods for studying other works of literature should be applied to the Bible. Um, there, uh, they had an influence on the uh, reform movement so that in the 19th century, we have an orthodox pushback. That is to say, what we're going to look at this evening are several orthodox Bible commentators of the 19th century, each of whom in one way or another, and to one extent or another, was writing in defense of the traditional rabbinic approach to biblical commentary, and in opposition to the approach that characterized the Haskalah and the reform movement. So I place them all in their um, proper chronological order. So we start with Rabbi Yaakov Tzvi Mecklenburg, whose Torah commentary he called Hakatav VeHakabalah. The truth of the matter is, for that, if you can figure it out, um, that says it all. Meaning, the title that he chose for his Torah commentary tells you all you really need to know about it. The rest is just in the details. Hakatav, of course, refers to the text itself. And Kabbalah here doesn't mean mysticism. It means tradition. Ketav, the text, Kabbalah, the tradition. And essentially, by entitling his Torah commentary, the text and the tradition, Rabbi Mecklenburg was making a statement. And the statement was that the only proper way in which to understand the text was through the tradition. And we can see this in this small excerpt from the introduction he wrote to his Torah commentary. 
in which he says, Hakatav Hakabalah, the text and the tradition, or in other words, Hatorah, that would be the written text of the Torah. Vahamisora, remember, as I've said on a couple of previous occasions, Kabbalah and Misora are really the obverse sides of the same coin. You can look at tradition from the perspective of the younger generation receiving it and call it the Kabbalah, or from the perspective of the older generation that's handing it over and call it the Misora. So Katav and Kabbalah, Torah Misora, said Rabbi Mecklenburg, Hain Teomim. They're twins, meaning he probably even meant Siamese twins in the sense that they're inseparable. Umalo leguf haketav belo nishmat haKabbalah. That essentially the, the, the text itself, the consonantal text, isn't alive without the spirit enlivening it, and that spirit is the Kabbalah, the tradition. In his introduction, however, he does something very original. He's addressing the, as I uh, introduced it, the question of what is the relationship between the written law and the oral law, between the Torah Shebichtab and the Torah Shebaalpeh. And he wrote, and this is just to save us time, just the translation, I've seen fit to place that which follows, that is my introduction to this commentary, in order to carry the word on its lips and give public voice to people to understand why the words of Torah are so sparse in its written form, inexplicable without the oral tradition preserved by the sages of each and every generation. Why was everything not written explicitly in the Torah, obviating the oral tradition of its interpretation? Just to give a, 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 a quick illustration, okay? Um, if God didn't want us to eat cheeseburgers, why is there no verse in the Torah that says, thou shalt not eat cheeseburgers? All the Torah says in this regard is, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. So in essence, that's what he is giving as an example of how the words of the Torah are sparse, right? Lo t'vashel gedi b'chalei five words. And yet, those five words in the oral law, those five words in the tradition, occupy volumes. And here's his explanation of it. And as I said, it's quite an original explanation. He says that there is a great advantage to the spoken word over that which is only written. Orally, one may speak words of wisdom and communicate erudition, articulate one's thoughts externally, speaking sometimes out loud, sometimes softly, sometimes whispering, sometimes hinting with his eyes, sometimes gesticulating with his fingers, moving his head to and fro, even scraping his feet. There is no limb from head to toe that cannot shed light on his unilluminated thoughts. In other words, what Rabbi Mecklenburg is saying is that the tradition, the Torah Sheba'al Peh, is essentially the body language that accompanied the Torah Sheba'al from the time of its revelation. If you only read the text of the Torah, you don't get a hint as to how the words were recited. You can't tell whether something was meant to be understood as a declaration or whether it was intended to be understood as a rhetorical question. If, however, as somebody is reading that text, you can watch them, you can listen to them, you can hear the, the, um, the way in which they 
um, uh, they articulate it. Um, you can see what uh, uh, gestures might accompany the reading. So that, of course, gives you greater insight into the text than you could obtain only by reading the words off a printed page. Such movements as these, he continues, are like a beacon to all who see them. The speaker's manner of discourse, his posture while speaking, the tensing and relaxing of his elocution, these all are keys in the listener's hands to open the chambers in which the speaker's thoughts lie dormant. They are like a yardstick in the hands of the audience and to penetrate and gauge the depths of his ideas, to ascend and evaluate the loftiness of his heart and the extent of his comprehension. He can look them over, that is to say the words one by one, measuring the length of the boughs of his wisdom and the breadth of his understanding, searching, probing, getting to his ultimate truth. So in essence, in response to the criticism that was leveled against rabbinic uh, traditional interpretation, namely that it is um, superimposed onto the text. The argument of Rabbi Mecklenburg is no, to the contrary, this is the original and authentic meaning being read out of the text as though somehow the Torah Sheba al preserved the gestures and the nuances of the, of the printed text. Another early 19th century traditional Bible commentator, Rabbi Shmuel David Luzzato, usually known by the acronym of his name, Shadal, very different in many respects uh, in his approach to Torah commentary, even from that of Rabbi Mecklenburg. Um, Luzzato was very much more into philology, uh, into history, but nevertheless, he was still strong in his defense of tradition. And in his introduction to his Torah commentary, he wrote, Hayesod Harishon, Parshanut Shel Kitvei HaKodesh, that the very first principle of exegesis, of interpretation of Holy Scripture, is without doubt tradition. The Bible, he told us, was written in a language that died many centuries ago and is no longer spoken by any known nation. That was the case at the beginning of the 19th century. Whatever we presume to know about it today relies upon the information provided orally by our ancestors, father to son. Without this linguistic information, the Bible would be sealed off to us. As in fact, he says, even the alphabetic characters, the Aleph bet is unknown to us through any medium other than tradition. And to uh, to uh, reinforce this argument, he relates the famous story of Hillel and the prospective convert. If you recall, the story is that a prospective convert came to Hillel after having been um, rejected by Shammai. And he asked Hillel, uh, uh, how many Torahs do you have? And Hillel told him that there are two Torahs. There's a written Torah and an oral Torah. So he said to Hillel, I, I want to learn the written Torah. I'll trust you with respect of the written Torah. So on the first day of class, Hillel taught him Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet. On the second day, Hillel wrote Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet on the blackboard, so to speak. But then when he pointed to the letters, he said Dalet, Gimel, Bet, Aleph. Now, the fact that this was a Gentile and a prospective convert doesn't mean that he was a dummy. So he quickly recognized that Hillel had said something different the day before, and he challenged Hillel saying, but 
Yesterday, you told me something different. Whereupon Hillel taught him his first lesson. And the lesson was, as Shadal spelled it out here, that you have to rely on tradition even for the recognition of the letters of the alphabet. Therefore, said Hillel to the prospective convert, if you're going to trust me to teach you the alphabet properly, and that itself is only possible through tradition, then you have to be prepared to trust me for the oral law as well. Shadal then continued in his introduction, and he said that it's true that the passage of many hundreds of years has dulled the traditional understanding of our language considerably, and this is acknowledged by our most renowned authors, including those of the Talmud. It is reasonable to assume that at least those words that occur in the context of the commandments that our nation fulfills ubiquitously can be regarded as understood and comprehended with absolute certainty. Meaning, if the Torah describes something, something that happened once or that once was, or a place that from once upon a time, then there's no reason to assume that we necessarily understand that completely. But as Shadal points out, words like tzitzit or matzah, things that have become universal observance by the Jewish people that have been part of this tradition, an unbroken tradition, surely, he argues, we can, be, we can rely upon that tradition for our understanding. And in fact, he says, coming to the, what he calls the third rule of biblical interpretation, he says, that is, Oto hayesod shall call ma'ase enosh. It's the same principle that governs all human activity. And what is that? Hasechel hayashar, common sense. But he doesn't only mean common sense in the sense of logic or in, in a philosophical sense, meaning logic. He means common sense as it applies to language. Therefore, what does he consider to be a deviation from common sense? He says a deviation from common sense is misha mistapek bamashmaot hashitchit shel hamilim. Anyone who considers the literal meaning of words to be all that there is. Because he continues and explains that even if we were to ignore the importance of tradition, it occurs frequently in every book and in scripture in particular, that hamashmaot hamilim hanir'et v'hagluya la'ayim, that the meaning of individual words that meets the eye, that is to say, the dictionary definition of a word, lo tehe hamashmaot shel hamishpat kulo, does not necessarily help you to understand, meaning you can't simply understand a biblical text by taking out a dictionary and looking up every word in the dictionary. Because even after you have obtained the dictionary definition of all of the individual words in the sentence, that's not quite the same as understanding the sentence in its entirety. So we see again the defense of tradition against the uh, opinion to the contrary that felt that tradition was a, an obstacle to the proper understanding of the text, that it was meaning that was superimposed on the text by rabbinic interpreters rather than being, as it were, the innate meaning of the text, as it was extracted from it by historians and by philologists. The next of our 19th century commentators, again, moving along in chronological order, 
was Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. Of course, uh, very well known, certainly to um, people who reside in um, communities like those of Washington Heights in New York that trace themselves back to uh, not just to Germany, but specifically to uh, the city of Frankfurt am Main. Uh, Rabbi Hirsch was, or has been considered, the founder of modern orthodoxy. Now that's a strange thing. I don't mean modern orthodox um, as it is a sociological designation today for those people who are not quite ultra-Orthodox on the one hand, and yet are somewhat more religious than conservative on the other hand. I mean that Samson Raphael Hirsch has often been called, maybe I should rephrase that, the father of orthodoxy in the modern period. That, that sounds a little better. Um, it was during Samson Raphael Hirsch's lifetime, and particularly while he was the head of several Jewish communities in Germany, that the reform movement um, basically uh, um, e emerged um, and sought recognition on the part of government authorities. Uh, the situation in, in Europe, certainly in, in Central Europe, in the uh, late 18th, early 19th century was that um, Jews could organize into their own communities, providing that they were recognized as such by the government. So until the, um, uh, until the appearance of reform Judaism, uh, the only variety of Judaism that ever appealed to the government for recognition was Orthodox Judaism, traditional Judaism. With the arrival of the reform movement, however, they began to petition for recognition as a legitimate Jewish community, and Samson Raphael Hirsch responded to that challenge. What I have here are a couple of excerpts from uh, a portion of Hirsch's commentary in the book of Genesis and Sefer Bereshit. It's at the beginning of the Sidra of Toledot, and it describes the um, upbringing of the two sons of Isaac and Rebekah, namely Yaakov and Esav. The verse number 27, of which you see the first word on the top of the page, Vayigdulu, says Vayigdulu Hanearim, that the uh, young men grew up. Vayhi Esav ish sadeh, right? Esav became a man of the great outdoors, a hunter. Yaakov ishtam Yoshevo Halim, while Yaakov was a shepherd, and, uh, and that was his profession. So this is what Hirsch uh, wants us to take away as a lesson from the way in which Isaac and Rebekah raised their children. Our sages, who never objected to draw attention to the small and great mistakes and weaknesses in the history of our great forefathers and thereby make them just the more instructive for us. Meaning he's calling our attention to the fact that, uh, that uh, the rabbis of the Talmud and the Midrash and for that matter, even those rabbis who uh, wrote Bible commentaries would on occasion criticize biblical figures, right? Here too, right, on Vayigdulu, the sages make a remark, which is indeed a signpost for all of us. They point out that the striking contrast in the grandchildren of Abraham, why is it that, that, that Esau became a hunter and Yaakov became a, well, again, from the rabbinic perspective, he wasn't just a shepherd, he was a, a Yoshevo Halim in the sense of someone who sat and learned Torah. So as it were, Yaakov was, we would say, from, right? While Esau was not. So they ask, that they, they point out that the striking contrast in the grandchildren of Abraham may have been due not so much 
to a difference in their temperaments as to mistakes in the way they were brought up. As long as they were little, no attention was paid to the slumbering differences in their natures. Both had exactly the same teaching and educational treatment. And the great law of education, Chanoch Lana'ar Alpi Darko, raise up a child, train a child in accordance with his own way, was forgotten. Namely, what was forgotten by, by their parents, by Yitzchak and Rivka, that each child must be treated differently with an eye to the slumbering tendencies of his nature and out of them be educated to develop his special characteristics for the one pure human and Jewish life. Meaning what Hirsch is basically saying is that Isaac and Rebecca failed in the education that they provided to their children. Why? Didn't they send both of their children to day school? Yes, they did. But that, says Hirsch, was the mistake because Aesop should not have been sent to day school. His parents should have recognized that while Yaakov would thrive in a day school environment, Aesop would be turned off. The great Jewish task in life is basically simple, one and the same for all, but in its realization is as complicated and varied as human natures and tendencies are varied and the manifold varieties of life that result from them. And he says, continuing, had Isaac and Rebecca studied Aesop's nature and character early enough and ask themselves, how can even an Aesop, how can all the strength and energy, agility and courage that lies slumbering in this child be won over to be used in the service of God and the future Gibor be trained to become not a Gibor Tzayid, a hunter, but in truth, a gibor lefnei Hashem, which is what the Torah calls nimra, right? Meaning a, 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 a valiant person, but one who is dedicated to the servants of God. Then, says Hirsch, Jacob and Esav, despite the fact that they had totally different natures, could still have remained twin brothers in spirit and life. Quite early in life, Esau's sword and Jacob's spirit could have worked hand in hand. And who can say what a different aspect the whole history of the ages might have presented? But as it was, only when the boys had grown into men, one was surprised to see that out of one and the self-same womb, having had exactly the same care, training, and schooling, two such contrasting persons emerged. First time I ever read that, who can say what a difference, different aspect the whole history of the ages might have presented, I got a chill. Because it, it, it's, it's, it's almost as though Hirsch in Germany in the first part of the, or the middle of the 19th century is looking a hundred years down the road and foreseeing the Holocaust and wondering whether somehow not just the Holocaust, but the entire 2000 year history of anti-Semitism might have been avoided. But he's not done with his criticism. A second factor, which could only have a pernicious effect, was the difference of the feelings of the parents towards the children. Remember it says that, that um, Yaakov loved Esav, because Esav would feed him. Verivka, 
while Rivka, oh, have it at Yaakov, loved Yaakov. Hirsch doesn't think that this is such a great idea either. Unity and complete agreement of parents in the education and the same feelings and love to all their children, even to those who are not so good, yea, just those require most of all, even more than those who are physically weak or ill, loving care and consideration and sacrifice. That, says Hirsch, is the first fundamental condition and the cornerstone of every education. That Isaac's sympathies were more inclined towards Esau and Rebecca's to Yaakov can moreover, he says, be easily explained by the attraction of opposites. Not going to get into that. Hirsch's commentary is uh, accessible. And if it's uh, piqued your curiosity, you can find it easily. We move along now to perhaps, I would say, certainly the most, well, I would say the most important of the orthodox responders to the challenges of uh, the reform movement and of uh, critical biblical study in the 19th century, Malbim, which itself is an acronym, as you can see, for Mayor Leib Ben Yechiel Mechel, whose family name, since they already had such things in uh, Central Europe, and particularly in Romania in the middle towards the end of the 19th century, was Weiser. You may recall when we examined Ibn Ezra's approach to uh, Tanakh, we read a passage from Ibn Ezra's introduction to his commentary to the Aseret Dibra, the 20th chapter of the book of Shemot, in which he was addressing the classic question of how do you reconcile the fact that the Torah gives us two versions of the Aseret Dibrot, and they're not identical, right? That, uh, that um, uh, discrepancy that is uh, basically um, uh, encapsulated in the phrase, Zachor v'shamor b'dibur echad ne'emro. So if you may recall, Ibn Ezra's argument and it was followed uh, by Radak as well, was Ha'ivri, biblical authors, Shomer Ha'te'amim, concerned themselves primarily with conveying a certain meaning and understanding, Velo Hamilot, but they were less concerned, if at all, with the choice of words. Therefore, Ibn Ezra said, since essentially Zachor and Shamor mean the same thing, as for example, do the two versions of the last of the Ten Commandments, lo tachmod, lo tit ave, since essentially they mean the same thing. Right? The fact that they are technically two different words doesn't matter as much as the fact that in spite of being different words, they convey the same meaning. Therefore, Ibn Ezra, and particularly Radak, since it's mostly Radak's commentary on Nevi'im that we study, certainly on Nevi'im Rishonim, we don't have Ibn Ezra, but in any event, when it came to interpreting what modern scholars call parallelism, right? a standard feature of biblical poetry, namely where an idea is expressed through the use uh, expressed twice in a sentence through the use of synonyms, mostly synonyms, but occasionally even antonyms. Classic example, ha'azinu ha'shamayim va'adabera v'tishma ha'aretz imrefi. Ha'azinu, tishma, same thing, both mean to listen. Shamayim va'aretz, of course, are two completely different things. One is heaven, one is earth, but essentially each one here is serving as, uh, as a, a substitute for the universe, right? And adabera and lemor, lidabera and lemor again are entirely synonymous. 
So the approach of Ibn Ezra and the approach of Radak to biblical par to parallelism as a feature of biblical poetry is that what you have is repetition. Meaning the second half of the verse means the exact same thing as the first half of the verse. It just chose to express it in different words. Quoting Radak on this phenomenon, he called it kefel ha'inyan b'milim shonot, the replication or repetition of the matter through the use of different words. Malbin took a different approach, not per se an original approach, because essentially the approach that Malbin adopted was the same approach that had been adopted originally by the Midrash, because the Midrash tends to treat synonyms as different. But Malbim carries that idea to its logical conclusion. And throughout his commentary on Tanakh, he basically treats biblical poetry, not as entirely synonymous or repetitious, but rather as though the second half of a poetic verse doesn't just recapitulate the first part, but it adds something to it. That its choice of synonyms signifies a change in the meaning that it wants to convey. So the selections here are all from the introduction to his commentary on the book of Yeshayahu, the book of Isaiah. And in it, he says, Amudei HaTavech, right? The pillars, the central pillars. Asher HaPerush Nish'an Aleihem, on which my commentary rests. Heim Shlosha. What is the first of his three pillars? We shall not encounter in prophetic poetry repetition of a matter through different words. And notice he even uses the phrase that Radak had coined to describe this phenomenon, kefel in yan bimilim shonot. But whereas Radak accepted that as a working proposition, Malbim rejects it. Not the repetition of entire topic, a whole statement, not even of a single line, not two sentences with the identical meaning, neither two parables with the same intended subject, nor for that matter, he says, even two repetitious or synonymous words. So the first principle by which Malbim abides is the rejection of the idea that biblical poetry simply repeats itself. The second point, he says, is that again, these lyrical or poetic things that we find in Tanakh do not contain either nouns or verbs that have appeared by accident. Meaning there are no extra words. Not only are all the words, whether they're nouns or verbs from which these statements are compounded necessary for those statements, but there's no way that God could have gotten his meaning across any other way. All the words in any divine lyric, he says, have been weighed on the scales of wisdom and knowledge, have been set, preserved, counted out, calculated by the attribute of God's sublime wisdom, and has the exclusive ability to speak in such an exalted fashion. And finally, he says, again, prophetic lyrics or poetry do not contain husks, klipa, shells, below toch, without content. Gvia, bodies, belinishama, without a soul. Lavush, a garment, 
below mitlabesh, without somebody who is wearing the garments, or in other words, ma'amar reik me ra'ayon niskav. Nothing in the Bible says Malbim is devoid of a uh, uh, of, of some sublime idea. Ki debrot Elohim chayim kulam, because all of the words of the Bible were spoken as it were by God. Ruach chayim ba'apam. It's as though they're alive, as though they breathe. Now. How does all of this translate into actual commentary? Here's a verse. It's the third verse in the opening chapter of the book of Yeshayahu. Yada shor konehu, an ox knows its owner. Vachamor, a donkey, evus ba'alav knows its master's trough. On the contrary, in contrast, however, Yisrael, the Jewish people, lo yada, they don't recognize their owner, their master. Ami, the people of Israel, to whom the prophet Yeshayahu belongs, lo hit bonan, they just can't get it. Okay. Now, Ibn Ezra or Radak, looking at this verse, would say, Shore is a barnyard animal, Hamor is a barnyard animal. So the, the prophet here is just simply giving examples of barnyard animals. The fact that he mentions the ox and the, and the donkey as opposed to, let's say, I don't know, a cow and, uh, and a, 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 a horse is just simply, you know, that was his preference, okay? A kone is somebody who becomes an owner through acquisition by purchase. A Baal is an owner who might become, who might exercise his ownership in a different fashion, but essentially that's the same thing. So Ibn Ezra and Radak would look at the verse and say, you know what the message is? The message is that even barnyard animals if I'm allowed to, I don't know if it's politically correct to call them dumb animals, right? Certainly dumb in the sense of they don't speak, okay? That even barnyard animals will somehow express their gratitude to the hand that feeds them, while Israel not only, give, not only does it not give gratitude to its master, that is to God who sustains it, but even if you wish, bites the hand that feeds it. Malbim somehow manages to get considerably more out of it because Malbim maintains that the choice of the ox and the donkey was not just the choice of any two barnyard animals. They were chosen because each of them has a specific characteristic that the prophet wanted to use in his, in his rebuke to the children of Israel. So he says, we have evidence of two kinds of recognition, even in the nature of dumb animals. And here again, it's dumb because he says they're built midabarim, dumb in the sense of mute, okay? An ox, he argues, will recognize its master simply by his purchase of it. While a donkey, which has no recognition to that extent, will recognize him nonetheless when, when he places fodder in the trough for it to eat. So according to Malbim, Shor and Hamor are not just a synonymous word pair designating two barnyard animals, but they were chosen deliberately because of their different natures in which they perceive their relationships to their owners. Therefore, when the verse continues and says in comparison, in contrast, Israel does not know, they don't understand, that too, says Malbim, means two different things. 
And he continues, when I, God, calls them by name, Israel, it's a sign that they are my lot, my acquisition, my servants. And they ought to recognize their master as an ox does. Nevertheless, they didn't come to know me. They didn't want to know. And when I elevated them above all the other peoples by calling them Ami, my people, Nachalati, my inheritance, they ought to have recognized this special favor, just the way the donkey recognizes its owner when it feeds them. Nevertheless, they do not comprehend, meaning they declined to understand. So here we get a sense of how Malbim was just extracting so much more from the text. Now, what enabled him to do this? Why, was he, why did he take issue, as it were, with the approach of Ibn Ezra and Radak? It's because he, he disagreed with them on what we might call a philosophical or even a theological proposition. What you see in front of you is a passage from the commentary of, of, of Abrabenel, uh, who was very much influenced by Maimonides. And Abrabenel maintained that Moses was the only prophet to whom God gave dictation. Therefore, only the Torah is the verbatim word of God. The rest of the Tanakh consists of messages that are divine, meaning there are things that God instructed the prophets to say to the people, but the prophets were able to, to word those messages however they chose. As it says here, uh, four lines from the bottom, other prophets, however, in their prophecies would see only the general outlines that God instructed them, and they would transmit and record them in their own words. So this is basically, if you wish, as I said, philosophical or theological platform on which, you know, uh, uh, to which Ibn Ezra and Radak were subscribing. Malbim, however, took a very different position. And what Malbim wrote here is, that not only is the essence of prophecy, not just the shoresh of the nevuah, something that God um, bestowed upon the prophet, but he says, so were the words, also the language in which the prophetic matter was addressed to the people. These were also not invented by the prophet based just on his intelligence and wisdom. Rather, he concludes, they were placed as it were either in his mouth when he was about to speak them or in his pen when he was about to record them. Therefore, since not only the ideas but the words are divine, then every word, whether it's a synonym or an antonym or whatever it happens to be, every word is imbued with significance. And indeed, uh, amongst modern uh, Bible scholars, there is a tendency to actually describe Malbim's approach to biblical interpretation as the approach uh, that embraces Omni significance, omni everything significance that every word is uh, is uh, um, significant precisely because of that position that the words were not just inspired by God, but dictated by Him. And finally, we come to the uh, last of our nineteenth-century. Uh, stalwart orthodox defenders of rabbinic interpretation, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, known again by his acronym of the Nitziv, who 
served for um, uh, quite some time as the uh, head of the famous yeshiva uh, in Volozhin. Uh, the yeshiva which was attended by, um, among others, um, Rabbi uh, uh, Avram Yitzchak Kohen Cook uh, and by Chaim Nachman Bialak. And here, in a manner that's very reminiscent of what we saw in the introduction um, of Rabbi Mecklenburg to the Ktava HaKabbalah, is the Nitziv's defense of the Torah Sheba'al Peh. His point of departure is a, a Talmudic interpretation of a verse toward the end of the book of, uh, to the end of the Torah, towards the end of the book of Devarim. In it, Moses instructs the, the, uh, the um, uh, Kohanim and the elders of Israel, kitvu lachem et hazot. He tells them to write this poem down, v'lamdah et b'nei Yisrael, and teach it to the Jewish people. Now, this is Deuteronomy chapter 31. If you know what Deuteronomy chapter 32 is, then you've probably figure out, figured out what poem he's referring to. Because Deuteronomy chapter 32 is Ha'azinu. Therefore, the simple, straightforward way to understand this verse is that Moses was telling the elders of Israel, that he was about to recite an important poem to them, and that he thought that it was important enough that they should all write it down. The Talmud, on the other hand, maintains that the word shira in this verse refers not just to any individual poem, but that in fact it's a euphemism to describe the entire Torah. To which the Nitziv raises the obvious question, Heich nikra kol ha-Torah shira, how can the entire Torah be called a poem? V'halolo nikhtava b'lashon shel shira. When it's perfectly clear that 95% of the Torah is prose. So his answer is, yesh ba teva usagulat hashira. He says, yes, the Torah, of course, is strictly speaking prose. But the prose, Torah prose, possesses the essence and the properties of poetry. Now, what does he describe as the essence and the properties of poetry? He says that there are two things, two characteristics of poetry that distinguish poetry from prose. The first one, he says, is its vocabulary. As a matter of fact, that's part of the way we refer to it. When we say that something is prosaic, that's another way of saying that it's ordinary. While if we say that something, somebody is waxing poetic, we're saying that this is something that is extraordinary. So says the Nitziv, the first characteristic of poetry is that poetry uses a special kind of vocabulary. Now, because this is a special vocabulary, we don't always understand what it means. Therefore, what do poets do? Or what do people do in order to enable us to understand poetry? They give us marginal notes, right? Twas the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year, right? What's he talking about? So there'll be a note saying, this was written to commemorate an event that happened during the Revolutionary War, okay? That's the first 
quality or characteristic of poetry, that according to Nitziv is shared by the Torah, meaning that you'll occasionally come across words in the Torah, which even though it's not a poem, are still unusual words. They're not the ordinary prose words. So if they're not the ordinary prose words, how will you know what they mean? You look in the margin for the glossary. Oh, but you tell me that in your Torah scroll, there is no, mar there is no glossary in the margin? Well, says the Nitziv, that's the Torah Sheba'al Peh. The Torah Sheba'al Peh, as it were, consists of the glosses that explain the unusual words in the Torah Shebikhtav. So if the Torah says, that the memory of Yitziat Mitzrayim should be with you as, uh, as though it were, uh, I, I, I used this um, uh, expression previously, right? As though you somehow tied a string around your finger, right? So the word ot is a reasonably ordinary word. But then the Torah says, Ule totafot ben enecha. Totafot is not a prosaic word. It's a poetic word. How do I know what it means? Easy, says the Nitziv. You got to look it up in your glossary. What's the glossary of the Torah Shebichtav? Easy, the Torah Shebaal Peh. What is the second quality or characteristic of poetry? that is shared by the prose of the Torah, rhyme or acrostic. Nitziv reminds us that occasionally poets take what we call poetic license, which means that they'll, they'll monkey around somehow with a word in order to produce a certain rhyme, or in order to produce a certain meter, or occasionally in order to produce a certain acrostic. And when we see that in a poem, we understand that it's done for a purpose. Ah, says the Nitziv, this also happens in the Torah. Occasionally you'll come across a word in the Torah and it doesn't look like it's spelled correctly. Or you'll ask yourself, why in the world did the Torah use this word when elsewhere in describing the same thing, the Torah uses a different word? Well, says the Nitziv, just as a poet might occasionally use different words or spell them differently in order to maintain a certain rhyme or a certain meter or to yield a certain acrostic, so it is that the Torah will occasionally use a different form of a word or even ostensibly misspell a word in order again to achieve some purpose. Want to know what that purpose is? You have to look in the Torah Shep al -Pet. Well, that's basically takes us up to the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And uh, let me have a look at the chat and see where we have here. Uh, I, I, I can't say anything about Hungarian neolog that will shed any light whatsoever on the history of Bible commentary in the 19th uh, century. Um, uh, I'm not even sure that Hungarian is a is is a an appropriate term uh, putting it into that 19th century context. That's why I, I referred to um, uh, Central Europe. I'm not sure that 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 Germany and Hungary are meaningful in that context. Probably less so than maybe Bohemia and Moravia. But uh, as I said, it, it, I I I have a lot to say about it, but nothing that's that's germane. Um, did Shadal know any Karaites? I'm, I'm sure he did. 
Um, I know Karaites. So I, if I know Karaites, I don't see at all why Shadal shouldn't have known them. I'm going to say some of my best friends are Karaites. That's not true, but I, 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 I do know Karaites. Where can I find a particular English translation of Hirsch? Hirsch. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it handy, uh, but um, uh, there is there is a um, a uh, five volume English translation of Hirsch. I use the one volume um, uh, condensed version. Um, the five volume I think was translated by Gertrude Hirschler. I don't know, for the life of me, I can't tell you why I remember that, but I do. I, I don't know who did the translation in the, uh, the translation in the abridged volume, but yes, the abridged volume probably is easier um, uh, to read than the five volume one. Um, if you drop me, whoever you, this is, if you drop me an email, Marty. msokolow at yu.edu, that you, Marty? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I'll be glad. I'll, 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 I'll send you a, a picture of the cover page. Thank you. Okay. So Malbim is putting the VM on par with Chumash. Yes. And perhaps the prophecy of Moses on par in that the words of the prophets are used if God dictated. And exactly. As I said, that's the, that's the philosophical difference between that, that, that underlies the approach that we saw in Ibn Ezra and Radak, even though they're, they're a bit older than all of this, um, as opposed to Malbin. Yes, that this is indeed correct. Halachic implications to the above? There are no halachic implications, uh, other than, of course, the fact that um, there are at least seven mitzvot de Rabbanan that, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, the Gemara certainly, uh, uh, you know, adduces halachot from passages in, in, uh, in prophetic literature, where would we be on Shabbat without the Pasuk in Yeshayahu of him in Tashiv Mi Shabbat Raglecha, right? Shelo Yehilukhacha Be Shabbat Ki Luchacha Bechol, and all of that. Um, so, yeah, it's indeed the way it is. Okay, Maxine? Um, uh, yeah, I think um, Isra has a question, or uh, is there something you would like to bring up? Did I see your hand up? But uh, I guess not. Um, okay, well, uh, thank you. That was um, uh, a great uh, overview of those uh, different, um, yeah, methods of Parshanut. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, tomorrow, of course, we have um, uh, Dr. Malka Simkovich giving her uh, final class on the Jews of ancient Egypt, um, Shuli Mishkin, um, on the um, archaeological sites uh, from Nach, and as well we have um, Rabbi Mordecai, uh, Mordecai Turchiner um, on the Parsha. So uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you either uh, then, uh, Friday, for um, uh, Rabbi Kelman's sure on the sitter or uh, next week. Thank you and uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Night, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks.